now begin our annual meeting, our 775th annual meeting. <laughs> I'm glad everyone responded appropriately to that. <laughs> it is, you are absolutely right. This is our 30th year um, that the Southport Open Land Foundation has been in existence. And um, we should have a little party later on <laughs> in the summer. Um, Attila has already volunteered just then to uh, <laughs> through that. So um, I'm Debbie Costine. I'm the vice president of the Southport Open Land Foundation. Our president, Whitney Beals, uh, could not be here. Um, he's, he's fishing in Montana. Good choice. Yeah. Um, so we have several things that we're going to be taking care of tonight. Just the, the introductory item is that um, uh, South Bar Open Land Foundation, I, we always like to say this, is not part of town government. We are a private organization, nonprofit, with, this, with the primary purpose of uh, preserving and protecting open space in town for the well-being and benefit of the current and future generations. Um, very often people are, assume that the, all of the land that we own is town property. Uh, for example, Beals Preserve has tremendous attendance um, people walk it, many, many people walk it every day, and, um, uh, but it is private property and we welcome walkers and we also welcome all of those who um, clean up after their pets and, and their <laughs> snacks as well. Um, I think the first thing that we would like to do is our first award, it's a special award that we don't give every year, and this is the award to um, Shannon Proven Provencal, you say it, and Catherine Gowdy. Would you two girls come up? And we're relying on, on the parents to maybe uh, get some good photographs so that we want to promote this. So this is, um, this is Shannon, and this is Catherine. They are, as you can see, scouts, and they created this wonderful event last fall called Hike Southboro Day. Um, and we loved it. We loved that they did it, and we loved how successful it, it appeared to be. Um, I'm now, having given you no uh, heads up on this, how did you happen to choose such a project? What was what, what did you think? Um, well, we enjoy just hiking in general. We do lots of hiking with our families. And the trails committee in Southboro came to us, and they were looking for people to help um, do trail work and open up the trails. So we decided that that would be a good opportunity to do our silver work. Oh, so and I knew that there was part of it. So a silver award is a specific part. I'm actually not familiar with that. Yeah, it's a Girl Scout award. It's the second highest award that you can earn in Girl Scouts after the Gold Award. Um, yeah. Excellent. Did you find that it expanded as you started working on it? Yes. It, got, <laughs> it grew and headed in more directions. Did you find that to be um, satisfying, rewarding? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. It was definitely a challenge, but it was, yeah. it was definitely rewarding. So just to give you an idea, I got a phone call, because I love leading hikes, and I got a, a phone call from Shannon asking me if I would lead a walk at Beals Preserve. Um, they had a 9.30 in the morning walk, and then another one scheduled on the Sudbury Reservoir Trail for 9.30. They had a two o'clock tour scheduled for um, uh, looking at the art installation at Beals Preserve, and then a tour of Chestnut Hill Farm, and then an evening stroll at Beals Preserve. That's just one feature of the day that, they, that these two girls put together. They organized um, 
through, through, with the help of Wegmans, um, trail snacks, water. They provided trail maps and they uh, put together a children's uh, scavenger hunt. And then they also included a little section of tips and tricks. Um, so hike safe guidelines, leave no trace, make hiking fun for children, and a component of geocaching. Um, and so it was, it was a wonderful idea. They carried it off with such poise and, and uh, so well organized and so mature, I was ever so impressed. So we now do, uh, thank you. So this is Outstanding Leadership. Southboro Open Land Foundation recognizes Catherine Gowdy and Shannon Provencal for their outstanding leadership in organizing the 2017 Hike Southboro Day. So this is for Catherine and Gowdy. Audubon. 
She is based at Broadmeadow Brook Sanctuary in Worcester, where she teaches classes on everything from dragonflies to climate change. She leads bird walks, plants rain gardens, removes invasive plants, which she was doing today, yes. uh, and talks to people about why we must protect the environment. She works with all ages, both indoors and out. On any given day, one might find her in front of a class or a TV camera, on her knees studying bees, or leading a group on the trail in search of hummingbirds. So um, this is her program on uh, supporting New England pollinators. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Yes, I was battling bittersweet this morning, and when I came home, there was a hummingbird in my bathroom. Oh, two of the two of the points. And the black throated green warbler singing in the tree at the sanctuary this morning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Such an exciting time. But we're gonna talk about pollinators tonight. And I know some of you have seen this talk already when I presented it for the Westboro Land Trust. So welcome back. Um, it's 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 a topic that there's a lot to know about. It's such an important topic, and I think it's such an important um, awareness-raising topic for, for our time. So thank you for being here, and thank you for listening. So our New England pollinators, so, okay, so I guess I'm going to tell you a little bit about Mass Audubon, which is another one of the wonderful conservation societies that we have in this commonwealth. Mass Audubon is the first and oldest continually operating conservation society in the country. And it was founded by two revolutionary women in Boston who could not vote at the time. So what they did, they grassroots grass worked and networked to change the fashion, which at that time was wearing big hats and decorating them not just with feathers, but with entire birds. And that, and doesn't that just seem awful? <laughs> but at one point, a hundred years ago, you would say, ah. Oh. But they, ch <laughs> she's wearing a dead bird on her, there's a children's book. But they changed people's outlook. And they tackled the millinery trade, which at that point was probably equivalent to our energy industry. And they won. And because of their efforts, not only do we have the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which protects our birds, but we also have the Massachusetts Audubon Society. And then from that was born the other New England Audubons and then the National Audubon. So Massachusetts, once again, is where it all started. Yay for us. <laughs> so today we are known for advocacy, so that's working with the legislation, legislator, legislature, local, state, and federal. We do land conservation. We protect 37,000 acres of land collaboratively, not just by owning it, but by working with the owners and working with other organizations to protect it. And we do education, which is what I'm doing here. Does this seem just a little bit? I'm going to stick with her focus. Okay. And this switch here is the one that's for those lights that. Okay. So this is Broad Meadow Brook. This is where I come from. And this is yeah. this is the sanctuary. It's 430 acres of conservation land in the middle of Worcester, in the southern edge of Worcester. And it works as a diverse habitat. There is human infrastructure running through it. This is a power line. But on that power line corridor, there are special birds that you won't find anywhere else in Worcester. So it works. And I tell people that, like, what can you see when you come there? Well, the only thing you can't see, we don't have moose. Yeah. We don't have bear. Yeah. 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 And we don't have porcupines. Oh. And we don't have porcupines because there are very few pine trees or evergreen trees because there's a history of fire on that land. And so there is a lot of blueberry, there are a lot of hardwoods, but no pines and the rest of the things that they support. Mm -hmm. But that's Broadmeadow Brook. So on to pollinators. 
why should we care about pollinators? They're pretty, but they're also useful. For us, they provide approximately 35% of the foods that we enjoy. If you like coffee, thank a fly. If you like figs, thank a wasp. If you like chocolate, thank a midge. <laughs> yeah. So all of these foods up here are given to us by pollinators. And E.O. Wilson, who is um, the famous, well, I'll let you read that. E.O. Wilson, who is a famous um, biologist at Harvard, and the, and the last time I saw him in person was at Chestnut Hill Farm for Biodiversity oh, Days yes. about yeah. 10 years ago. So it's awfully fun to make that connection tonight. Said every third bite of food you take, thank a pollinator. But there's more, because pollinators also give us flowers. And not us flowers, but everything out there, all the wildflowers, are there because of pollinators. They have evolved together. And even before there were honeybees here, because honeybees are brought in from Europe, there are wild bees and wild pollinators. And the wild plants have grown to rely on those pollinators. So it's a very tightly knit ecosystem. And just to explain to you a little bit, for some of you this will be review. For some of you, you may not have learned it yet. But how does pollination actually work? So pollination is the way that flowers reproduce and exchange genes that get genetic diversity um, into them and ultimately make seeds. So you have little grains of pollen that stick to the body of the insect. If you're a bumblebee or a honeybee, you might put that pollen in little baskets on your legs, but sometimes you just carry it around with you on your very fuzzy body. Bees are actually, some of them are seeking nectar, which is a, a sugary water with a little bit of proteins in it that the flower makes to attract the pollinators. Some of them are actually looking for pollen because they're going to use it. But in visiting the flower, that pollen sticks to the body of the insect. And then when it moves to another flower, it brings that pollen over with it. And that pollen then falls onto the female part of the flower. The pollen is the male. Um, Part, and it falls onto the stigma, which is a female part, and it grows a little tube, and that little tube grows all the way down to the ovule and fertilizes it. And then there are other, other things happen, and it also fertilizes the ovary, which turns into the fruit. So if you're eating an apple, the seeds in that apple have been fertilized, but the apple part that you eat is the ovary, and that was also fertilized too. That's how we get fruit. Quick question. Yes, so does the honeybee take it out of its body and put it on there? If it's not attached to its body? It, once it's in the, the pocket, it's not coming out until the bee takes it out. And when does, the bee doesn't take it out in another flower, when right. does the bee take it out? The bee does not purposely take it out. The bee, so the, the pollen that gets brought in, and given to the other flower is accidental. The bee does not intend to do that. It just works that way. Pollen is kind of sticky, mm -hmm. and the, the stigma is also sticky. If you touch, if you go to the store and buy a lily, and you touch the stigma right. part mm -hmm. of it, you'll find that it's very sticky. Mm -hmm. And that's so that it traps pollen. So does it put the pollen in those little sacks? It does. And why, why does it do that? Um, it's like packing a suitcase. It's, it's looking for pollen because pollen is food for its babies. Pollen is high protein. Okay. And so it's an efficient way to carry it. Only some bees do that, though. Honeybees and bumblebees can mm -hmm. do that. Um, the other little native bees that we're going to talk about just have long hairs that the pollen sticks to. And then they go in and they comb it off. For the feeding babies. Mm -hmm. So that the pollination, when it happens with the flowers, is just a byproduct of, of what you're doing. Exactly. Exactly. The flowers have figured out a way to make use of the bee without the bee knowing or caring. They're pretty smart, those plants. <laughs> so who are our pollinators? 
Well, in New England, we have three main groups of pollinators. We have butterflies, we have bees, and then we have one bird, which is our hummingbirds. So I think I get to talk to you a little bit about that. There are other kinds of insects that are accidental pollinators. Um, beetles is a big group of insects, lots of diversity there. And they also feed on pollen and feed on nectar. And in the process, they do transfer a little bit of pollen around, but they're not as good at it as bees. Oops, didn't need to do that. There we go. And then flies. Flies are pollinators too. And there are some flies that look like bees and they will fool you, but they're taking pollen from one plant to another as well. Do you have any bats around here pollinating? Nope. Uh, no, just in the, in the desert mm -hmm. and sometimes in the tropics. Our bats are insectiv insectivorous. So, so they're the bats. Yes. So bats are, are night pollinators, and like moths, they will go for, um, not go for, but night, night blooming flowers that are adapted to attract bats. And it turns out that many of our cacti are pollinated by bats. Okay, so those are our three main ones. So we're going to go through the birds, and then the butterflies, and then the bees. So one bird, this is easy. Ruby-throated hummingbird. That is the only kind of hummingbird that we have in New England. Uh, this one's sticking its tongue out at us. They weigh just a tiny amount. If you add up three paper clips, that's how much a hummingbird weighs. If it landed on your finger, you would never know. <laughs> they can fly non-stop across the Gulf of Mexico. This tiny little bird. Sometimes it takes them a couple of days. No place to land. They're flying continuously. Wow. The next time you see a hummingbird, you have to admire it. Mm -hmm. And they can flap their wings really, 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 really fast. 53 times a second. <laughs> Kudos to whoever figured that out. Right? So they, they breed in the eastern part of the United States all the way up through Canada. They migrate down here and sometimes they migrate across the Gulf and then they overwinter down in Central America. So that's where our hummingbirds go during the winter and come back from. I have a question. Do yes. they always go back to the same place or is it different places? I know that some birds go back to the same place. I don't know if anybody's figured it out for hummingbirds. Although I can tell you a story of a hummingbird that was a different species that found its way into a yard in Amherst area, and somebody, and it stayed there very, very late in the winter, and so people were worried about it. Somebody let it into a greenhouse, and it overwintered in the greenhouse, and in the spring they let it back out again. And then it came back in the winter and spent the next winter in the greenhouse. <laughs> so maybe they do go back. <laughs> it, yeah. amazing. Isn't it? Um, so you can tell male and, humming, and female hummingbirds apart. The male has this bright red throat, which shows up in certain, certain sunlight. Female and immatures have a white throat. They don't have the, the red patch there. And here are the babies. And that picture is taken from a nest that we found at Broad Meadow Brook one day. There was a little girl who was walking the trails, probably about your age, and she, she saw the nest and then let everybody know. So all the photographers came out because you don't get a chance to watch how baby hummingbirds grow up. How, what size would that nest be? I heard they're just ridiculously this, small. This, this tall. Okay. It's top. Yeah. And then and the inside is teeny, teeny, tiny, uh, like my thumb. Uh, and it's thumbs. made of lichens and spider webs. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fairy nest. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what is it? What do they tend to Their nest? preferred nesting site is close to water or over water. This one was in a red maple tree, and the branch stuck out over a stream. Hmm. And they were at the end of the branch. <gasps> 
And what I learned about baby hummingbirds is that they're not born with that really long bill. It grows over time in the nest. So you can see that their bill is about half grown up there. But why do they nest over water all the time? I have no idea. I don't know. Maybe it's because there are more insects over there? Another question. Mm -hmm. uh, we only have the ruby toad hummingbird here, mm -hmm. which I believe migrates to South America or Central America or Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. But yet, when you go to Costa Rica, there's dozens and dozens of hummingbirds. And different kinds, right? right. Yeah. So there are I'm just curious why would not some of the other ones migrate up to here as the ruby throat does? It's, it's instinctual. It's built in. The other ones live west of the Rockies. They have many more species over there. And they must follow that, that ridge and both end up in the same part, spot. It's not much land down there. Mm -hmm. right. Right. So yeah. there are other, a lot of other species yes. west, west of Yes. Yeah. If you go out to California, okay. um, you will see, they, it seems like they have many more hummingbirds out there. Different kinds as well as higher mm -hmm. numbers. Pretty spectacular. And they're very, ter very territorial over their feeders. They'll put on lots of little dog bites for you. Fun. Okay. So that's our bird pollinator. So butterflies are up next. And what I've done, what I'd like to do is to give you a little background about butterflies and a little tour just to touch on some highlights of, of some pretty butterflies that we have here. But um, I hope to leave you with a, a, some broader information about them. So these are two of our swallowtails. And this one is the spicebush swallowtail. Swallowtails seem to like to feed on lilies. And then this one is a giant swallowtail. We have a very common yellow um, swallowtail. It's called a tiger swallowtail. That used to be the biggest one in the state. But it's been... Um, surpassed by its cousin, the giant swallowtail. These are striking butterflies and very large. They have this black and yellow pattern with the big spots when they fold their wings out. But when they unfold their wings and they open them up, they're black with a triangle of yellow spots. You cannot miss them. Mm -hmm. So we have several butterflies that are new to the Commonwealth. Part of that is climate change. The butterflies, the southern butterflies are moving up. The northern butterflies are also moving up and eventually out. So our, our butterflies are changing. But I wanted to introduce that one to you because there's a good chance you might see one someday. So when you say they're large, how large? About this big. Wow. Yeah. They are giant. Giant small tails. So butterflies have a season. And this is the field card that the Massachusetts Butterfly Club, which I think I have wrong here, I think it's massbutterfly.org, uh, has, has put together from citizen science, from people reporting the butterflies that they see on any given day at wherever they, they happen to be. And they have decades of these records and they've put together this field card and the, the black lines are next to individual species. And you can see they start small and then get bigger and then get small again. So this butterfly, the dun skipper, starts in the middle of May. And then you'll see a lot of them flying in July and fewer in August. And they'll continue on to the end of September. So butterflies have different seasons. You can see some very early on in the summer, not on this card, these tend to be the later um, butterflies, but some are earlier and then some are, some are later. So butterflies have seasons. And here's, a, here's the monarch. So a few in April and then stronger and stronger and stronger as the season goes on. Is that publicly available? The, that route? It's that route. Yeah, that's, yes, it's on the web. So why are butterflies coming out at different seasons and what does that mean for us in the summer and the fall and the winter as far as the butterfly goes? Well, you've got to think about butterflies having a life cycle like, like all things do. 
and they go through an egg, and then the egg hatches and they turn into caterpillars, which is the larval stage. And then after a few weeks of munching down, they will pupate um, and form a chrysalis. Butterflies form chrysalis, and moths have it spin an extra layer around that, that chrysalis and make a cocoon. So that's the difference between butterflies and moths. Moths do cocoons. About two weeks in the pupal stage, and then it will hatch out into an adult butterfly. And some butterflies spend the winter as adults. Those are the earliest flying ones that we have. That would be our morning cloak and eastern comma and question marks. So if you think, of, you know, in the winter under fallen logs or inside um, the crevices of stone walls, there might be butterflies sleeping the winter away, hibernating butterflies. Some butterflies spend the winter as eggs. Some butterflies spend the winter as caterpillars, which is a good reason not to rake all the dead leaves out from your gardens, because that's where the caterpillars hide in overwinter. And some of them spend the winter as pupa. And they're, they're hidden away so that hopefully a bird isn't going to find them and snack on them during the winter. But then they'll come out during the spring or summer and be our butterflies. So butterflies overwinter in, in different stages. So now all butterflies will go south. Very few butterflies go south. The only one that we know of for sure is the monarch. We suspect that painted ladies migrate, but we haven't figured out where they go yet. There's a lot to learn. Are you saying that they continuously go through these stages mm -hmm. and they keep recreating themselves? I mean, they don't. I, I assume butterflies die in the winter. But they that's don't. That's not true. They do not die in the winter. Mm -hmm. So the adult butterfly, the average butterfly in Massachusetts, the adult will live maybe six weeks as a butterfly. Mm -hmm. But before it dies, it will have laid eggs. Okay. And those eggs will either hatch during the summer or they'll wait until after the winter to hatch. But the lifespan is only six weeks. As an adult. As, a, as an adult. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is about a year from, from egg to death. So which one are these are the butterflies over winter in the, in the logs? So three butterflies that I know of over winter as adults. Okay. Yeah. So it's di different species do different things. Harris checker spot, which is a butterfly that I'm interested in, spends the winter as a caterpillar, um, second in star. So it's about this big. Fritillaries, does anybody know the great spangled fritillaries at the end of the summer, the orange, mm. orange and black butterflies with the silvery spots on the back? Those lay their eggs on violets. The eggs hatch in the fall. The caterpillars drop down into the soil under the leaves without eating, and they spend the winter like that. Wow. Yeah. And then they'll start eating when the leaves come out, like right now. So every species does it a little bit differently, has their own way of doing it. Yeah. So if I know I have some of those violets in my lawn, and if I put down any grub killer, does that also affect these guys? Um, what kind of grub killer? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm just trying to see if I should just go cold turkey and just let see where the lawn goes. You know where I'm uh, going to tell you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so my husband has the front yard and I have the backyard. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think the the BT, the the bacteria, will not impact the butterflies, but I don't know. Great question. Do the grubs compete with these guys? No, because the, the grubs are eating the roots. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And the caterpillars are eating the leaves. Which brings me to my next one. Um, uh, question? Yeah. Why does the monarch take three generations to migrate to Mexico and just one to come back? Or, or, or they have that backwards? You don't. Uh, yes, you do. 
it, yes, they take one generation to get down to Mexico, and then three to come yeah. back. Why is that? It's the same distance. <laughs> 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 yes, maybe the winds are blowing differently. Yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a, that's a great question. But thank God they do because yeah. it's all, all of the country gets to see them. Um, just to draw attention to the incredible things that happen right under our, our noses, butterflies from the larval stage to the adult stage go through this incredible anatomical transformation. The caterpillar is made for chewing up leaves and it's got these really chewy mouth parts to grind those leaves up. And the adult doesn't eat leaves at all. It sucks nectar or mud or wherever, whatever else it gets can get to get its energy and its protein and its, and its minerals that it needs. So to do that, the mouth has to change. And it goes from, so there's the, do I have? No, I don't. OK. So this is the best I can get of a caterpillar mouth part. Um, so these two big jaws that just grind up the leaves and bite into the leaves. And then the butterfly mouth turns into this tongue called a proboscis, which is featured right here. And then this is what it looks like under a microscope. When the butterfly first comes out of its chrysalis, its tongue is in two parts. And it has to unroll them and then zip them together. They are like a zipper. And if you have the chance to ever watch a butterfly emerge from a chrysalis, watch its mouth because you can see that happen. It unrolls it and rolls it back up a couple of times. It's getting those teeth zipped up just exactly. Um, just if anyone hasn't been to the Caterpillar Lab, the Open Space Commission hosted twice. They have a museum in Key, New Hampshire. They're having an exhibit in um, next week in New England. They keep samples, microscope cameras on it while this is happening, and you can watch it on TV. It's the most fascinating thing in the world. And you can go to his website. I'll send a link out, because he posts them on his Caterpillar Lab website. And you can watch some just really crazy, amazing things. I went there, but I only saw the chrysalis. saw the chrysalis? Well, a little later, one of them was stuff happening all the time, just having a patient and wait, because it took a while. Okay, yeah. perhaps if we, if you post that, if we post that on the, um, on our Facebook, sorry, the, on our website, um, I have brochures in the other room in a stand that would have information on how you can get to our website so that we can, if anybody's interested in watching that, I think that yeah. sounds fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, his, his videos are amazing. And he's an artist. Yes, he started out as a photographer. He started out as a little boy who was interested in bugs. Yeah. And then he learned how to take pictures. Mm -hmm. And then he's figured out how to make a living doing this. Mm -hmm. and turn, he, and turn I don't know about that. Well, he's trying hard, so support him. We may actually have him lead a caterpillar walk. We're working on that thing this Good. summer. Good. He's a, he's a really nice guy, too. OK. Um, <laughs> so, the next point I want to leave you with is that caterpillars, baby butterflies, can be really picky eaters. They are chemically adapted to hone in on certain kinds of plants, and they will only eat those plants. If you don't give them those plants, they will starve. Really picky eaters, we're talking about. So, when you are thinking about supporting butterflies, it's good to have pretty flowers that make lots of nectar so that the grown-up butterflies can eat. And the kinds of, of flowers that butterflies seem to like, most butterflies, are, are flowers that allow them to, to land and have space. So things with lots of little flowers in them um, or things that are kind of flat and allow them to land seem to work well. It seems, it seems to be their preference. The colors don't, don't matter so much. But you don't, you also want to have plants that feed the babies because if you don't have baby butterflies, aka caterpillars, 
you won't get the grown-up butterflies too. So different butterflies like different plants. This is the larva of a painted lady, and it likes to eat this thing called pearly everlasting. Mm -hmm. We know that monarchs like to eat what? Milkweed. 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 Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, some, some butterflies aren't as picky, like the morning cloak will eat willows or poplars they'll, they'll, or aspens, so they'll eat the tree leaves. Um, but spicebush swallowtails will eat only spicebush or sassafras, for example. So learn, if you want to attract butterflies to your garden, um, learn what some of those good butterfly host plants are and you can incorporate them into your landscaping. Do you, do you think that they're on the website for the butterfly club? I don't know because I haven't I haven't looked at there. But there are there are lots of websites and I'd be happy to, to talk to you and provide you. There's more. one that you can put in your zip code and I can send you that out. It will tell you which butterflies. Who does that? Mm -hmm. It's just a new it's a little it's a little clunky right now because it's still in beta. It's mm -hmm. um Doug Townley's new oh, one good. with okay. uh, the National Wildlife Federation. Okay. So that's, I can send you that. So if you go to just the National Wildlife Federation mm -hmm. and search through that website? I'm not sure, but I can send Saul the link and they can post it. Great. I have the link and I, I don't know how, it wasn't that easy to find it from uh -huh. the website because it's beta still, so. But. So Doug Townley mm -hmm. um, is, a, is an author who is promoting the use of native plants, plants native to our area mm -hmm. for landscaping on the theory that they better support the wildlife that are local to us. Mm -hmm. The butterflies, the caterpillars, the birds, everything. A a, an oak tree is a much better thing to plant than, um, I can't even think Ginkgo. of it. Yeah, Ginkgo, thank you. Yeah, Ginkgo's mm -hmm. not native to New England. So the bugs don't know how to eat it. Okay, I think this is the part where we go through a couple of different butterflies. So here's one that you probably are already seeing flying around. This is our white butterfly, cabbage white. It is very common, and its caterpillars like to eat plants in the mustard family. How big so is it? How big is it? It's only about this big, Max. Yeah, they're flying now. I saw a couple of them today. And cabbage whites, you can tell the boys from the girls by the number of spots that they have. So the females will have two black spots on their wings, and the boys, the males, will have one black spot on their wings. So females have two, and males have one. Aren't many butterflies you can do that with. The cabbage white is fun too. Here's the great spangled fritillary that I talked about earlier. This is the one where the caterpillars eat violets. <laughs> and this is what the, the butterfly looks like when it's grown up. Here's the silvery spots underneath. This one is probably about this big around, and it doesn't stay still. It is amazing that, that Barbara Spence got this picture of it, because they don't stay still for nothing or nobody. They are always flitting around. So without violets, there would be no great spangled fiddler. Exactly. Joint effort between the Mass Butterfly Club and Girl Scouts. 
There's a Girl Scouts troop that sponsored this as our state butterfly. So doing lots of things. This one, if you play up parsley or carrots, you will find the eggs and the caterpillars on this one in your garden. Or dill. Like dill too. Those are all in the same family. So we don't have the state butterfly? No. Not yet. That's, that's amazing. Isn't it? <laughs> I think we have a state insect, which is the lady bug. Yeah. All right. You ready to move on to bees? Okay. So I think of bees as two kinds based on their behavior. We have social bees, which is the bees that we're most familiar with, the honeybees and then the bumblebees. And they're, they're related. These are the bees that build colonies to nest in. In honeybees, we call that hives. In bumblebees, we just call it a colony because it's not nearly as big as a hive. A hive is about at least 10,000 bees. And bumblebees are only about 200 in their colony. But most of our native bees are actually solitary. They do not build hives. They do not build colonies. They might nest near each other, but it's kind of like a condominium complex. Everybody's got their own apartment. So there's no queens. I say stingless, but they're not. They, they do have stingers, so they will sting only if they're directly threatened. So if you go to do this, there's a chance that they'll sting you. But if you just do that, they're going to fly away because you're not threatening them. Or if you stand still. If you stand still, they're not going to do anything. They might check you out and they might buzz close, but they're not going to sting you. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Good. I remind my friends that. Even better. That's great. That's <laughs> why my friends are scared of bees. I know. A lot of people are scared of bees. And some people are allergic to bees, so it's okay that they're scared. But it's better to learn about them so that you don't have to be scared. So just um, to, to start with the social bees, they include our honeybees and our bumblebees. There's a honeybee. Honeybees are all about the same size, but they tend to have different colors. They live in hives. You can see all of the bees clustering around the entrance of the hive there. Any beekeepers in here? Well, this is the first audience. I haven't had any beekeepers in a while. My sister's a, bee My sister's a beekeeper. It's, um, yeah. No kids, so she really takes really good care of bees. <laughs> and then bumblebees are typical bumblebees. And this is what a bumblebee nest looks like. So they make wax cells out of wax that they secrete in their body. Some of those cells are filled with honey, so those are the honey pots. And then others are filled with baby bees. They'll lay one egg in each one, and then the workers will gather um, nectar and pollen to feed the babies. And the nests are started by a single queen. Those are the bumblebees that you're seeing buzzing around right now. Here's the life cycle of the bumblebee. So in the winter, you'll have one queen overwintering in the ground. She'll search out an old mouse hole, rodent hole, cavity where a root had been, just a hole in the ground. And she'll spend the winter. And then she wakes up. And she forages for food for herself but also she's looking for a place to make her nest, her colony. So right now, I'm seeing a lot of bumblebees that are flying really low over the leaves and in the gardens. And I think they're searching for places to make their nest. So she starts out with one pot, will lay an egg, and then continually add to that, and eventually end up with maybe 200 worker bees. In the middle of the summer, some of those eggs that hatch out will be males, and some will be new queens. And then you'll have the males and the new queens um, mating and starting the next generation down here in the winter. So it's a cycle. Are all the female bees queens? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so a, a queen, by definition, is a female bee that lays eggs and produces the next generation. All the worker bees are also female, but they're workers. They, they don't mate. So bumblebees have workers the same way that honeybees have workers. Just and, and males are only, only mate. They don't work. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> They got kicked out of the hive. They don't. They can't. They can't go back. Really? So they're homeless. They're hanging out in the garden, and they're. You know, they take a little while to wake up in the morning because they don't really have anything to do. Another one of our solitary bees. 
So the, the one on the left, to me especially, if I think if I were to see it, I would think it, it's a fly. Yeah. So how is, are bees different from flies? I've never thought about this. Hello. <laughs> Great <laughs> question. <laughs>
There is a ball of pollen that's held together with nectar and secretions from the bee. And on top of that ball of pollen is a little egg that will hatch out into a little grub and eat the pollen and grow. Um, and it will take probably nine months, nine or ten months, for that little bee to grow and then hatch out. And this, so these bees are out flying now, laying their eggs, gathering the pollen. They'll seal the hole up, and that will probably be June or July. And then those eggs are going to stay underground until March or April of next year. And they will hatch out as fully formed bees. Do they, do they carry the, the jerk up? They do, they make a little mound. This is, yeah, it's cool. She'll show you. <laughs> there are other kinds of bees that build their nests in hollow stems or in decaying wood. And mason bees, the difference is what they line their nests with. So mason bees will line each cell with mud. Leaf cutter bees will line each cell with pieces of leaves that they have cut. And cellophane bees, or plasterer bees, make a secretion, a synthetic secretion that's very much like cellophane, and is waterproof, and line their egg cell with that. Is this like a cross-section cut open? Or? It is, okay. yes. I'll show you. I'll show you a picture of how we support those later on. So this is a leaf cutter bee. They've got huge mouth parts to cut these circles in leaves, and then they bring that the circle in and then use that as a construction material. Carpenter bees are also native bees, and they use decaying wood. You might see carpenter bees exploring along your house up under the eaves. That's because eaves tend to be a place that's where the wood decays quickly because there's a lot of moisture. So they will not attack solid wood. If you have bees in your house, the bees aren't destroying the wood. Your house is already rotting and you need to fix it. <laughs> so how can we take care of our bees? Well, any and every creature needs to have food, it needs to have water, it needs to have a place to raise babies, and it needs to have a, a safe place where it can take shelter. And in the garden, that translates into be a little messy, leave bare spots so that the bees can dig into the ground, use native plants because they are better at providing the pollen and the nectar that our bees are adapted to, and don't use chemicals in your garden if you can help it. So I wanted to show you a picture of what it looks like to have bees in your yard or on the dirt. These little bumps are not anthills. If you see something that looks like an anthill, look really close. If there are ants, it's an anthill. If there aren't ants, and there's, there's a hole that's about the size of a pencil or smaller in diameter, Chances are it's from bees. Mm. I found one in my garden this week. I was so yeah. excited. <laughs> what about cicada bees? The cicada killers? Yeah. Those are yeah. wasps, yeah. I mean, as big as birds. That's amazing, yeah. Are they okay? Do they go after native bees or? Small children. <laughs> 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 Um, I don't believe that they go after native bees. They are adapted to go after cicadas. So they come out at about the same time of the year that cicadas are out. Okay. Yeah, the bees are probably way too small for them. That would be like um, like a red-tailed hawk attacking a worm. Mm -hmm. Why bother, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so they're on the same cycle as the cicadas? Yeah. Well, I don't think they're on the same cycle as the, the the 17 year cicadas are Because there's different cicadas in different cycles, right? Right. But we also have cicadas that are just annual. They're just there every year. And it's been the cicadas kill it. Okay. So
So finally, the, um, the chemicals portion of it. A lot of the synthetic chemicals that we put on our yards and in our gardens are really good at killing insects or really good at killing weeds. Um, and they're not good for our native bugs. So when the mosquito squad folks come and spray for mosquitoes, they're also killing dragonflies, they're also killing any bees that happen to be out flying. Um, so I advocate for, for no chemicals. The thing that you really, really have to be careful with is the neonicotinoids up here. That's um, Im imidacloprid is a big one. They can't, there's a couple of them out there. The EU just banned neonicotinoids completely. We haven't gotten the EPA to do that yet here. We probably won't. Oh, it's 14, yeah. Yeah. But we are getting good at asking companies to label when they've been treated with these chemicals. These chemicals are bad because they're effective at extremely low concentrations. They do not break down in the soil. And they don't necessarily kill bees outright, so you don't see us dead bees everywhere. But they mess with the bees' immune system, they mess with their memory, and they mess with their behavior. So for the honeybees, there are bees, honeybees that have been uh, exposed to neo neonicotinoids come back to the hive, and they can't do their waggle dance to tell the other bees where the flowers are, for example. And we also suspect that the bees that have been exposed to these have lowered immune systems, so they can't fight off the viruses and, and the parasites and everything else that's attacking them. So we really do think that these are at the root of the problem. So when you're buying plants, ask if they've been treated. You can ask for organic plants. Plants have been raised organically. Um, do, do your part to raise awareness. Keep it Some out of your garden because it's not good. Posted just recently um, a, a, a tag on a plant that said um, contains neonicotinoids, um, and then underneath it says approved by the EPA. Yep, yep. Which is yeah. I started. It is I, approved by the EPA. Right, right. Yeah. And I looked it up and I read their explanation, yeah, and the they just said that it, it doesn't it doesn't meet the preponderance of evidence that exists that it's safe. And so until somebody beats them over the head with it, it's... There's a bill that says it's not in our state senate and House of Representatives, Carolyn Dykema started it with some Jamie Aldrich is on board and it's to start reducing when you can use it. It's not an all outright ban, but it's a beginning and yeah. Mass Audubon, I think, actually supports that as yes. well. Um, so our, our, our state rep has been very proactive to the best she can be, given there's a huge pressure back from the farming and um, other communities that yeah. say, what else are we going to have if we can't use that? So, I mean, it's not a simple, if you don't use that, what else are you going to use? So it's complicated. Yeah, it is complicated. Raising awareness is a good so thing. So when, that, good when thing. that tank says approved by the EPA, mm -hmm. does that could it, could it mean that there are different types of neonic? Neonic? Can you say neonic? Neonic. Oh. There you go. <laughs> if, if, if it was a pesticide that wasn't approved by the EPA, it would be illegal to have used. So it's sort of a sort of a tag that's saying like this isn't going to send you to jail. So what? Great. I mean, it doesn't tell you what it is. Yeah. What happened is there was a threatened boycott of the big box stores. So this is Lowe's and Home Depot. And the response of one of them was to try to phase out using them. And the other one said, well, we'll, we'll in the meantime, we'll, we'll label which ones have it. And then their label came out, which was to the unknowing, would say, oh, this is fine to use. Right. Because EPA says it's OK. So it was really sort of a backhand. Protected. It's problematic. <coughs> aphids, white flies, beetles, and mainly bugs. It's protected by neonics. I've been um, I've been to Home Depot a couple times this season and I've looked at their plant tags and I'm not seeing anything that's labeled. 
So I don't know if that means that they phased it out. Because they're not required to label. That was just something right. they did to appease the, right. the threatened boycott. Yeah. So. so it's good to ask. It was kind of like cigarettes. It used to be. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Can I make a suggestion? Instead of asking, find some place you know and trust. Like Garden in the Woods, Bigelow's is good, um, but find a place and work with a regular nursery that you know, you're pretty confident, because most of them don't even know because they're getting them shipped in from some, you know, they're somewhere else coming in, and um, they don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I, I did this talk uh, in Shrewsbury, and they wanted to give out seeds, and so we had this long conversation because seeds are treated with neonics too, and then that carries through into the plant. Mm -hmm. And they found a supplier who had organic seeds that did not have this, so that's one way to, to do it. Okay. So what you can do instead of chemicals is to practice gentle pest mm -hmm. control. So sometimes there are other biological predators that will um, that will that will act on those those pests. The hoverflies, for example, will take care of your aphids. For the oriental um, lily beetle, I take them and I I physically take them off of my lilies and I put them into a bucket of soapy water, water with just a drop of dish soap, and that that drowns them. So I don't have to use the chemicals on that. Um, slugs, beer, diatomaceous earth mm. works on them, they don't like to cross it. So there are lots of creative ways to, to take care of problematic <coughs> pests where you don't have to use chemicals. And then providing those safe spaces and places to raise your, your, your babies. This is what we do at Broad Meadow Brook. So we have this, this structure that is called a bee hotel. And these are very fashionable, and you can spend $30 and get a really nice looking one and stick it up in your house. Or you can find, make one from old pallets and bricks and logs and, and um, drainage pipe that you have lying around. And these are filled with hollow stems. We've used Phragmites commonly. It's an invasive, so you cut it down and then you can use it to support the bees. And then what the bees will do is they will enter in here and then they'll use these hollow stems to make their nests. And every time you see a stem that's solid at the end or filled, that's where a bee has laid its eggs. So, so this, this habitat, you're, you're talking bees other than honeybees. Not right, honeybees right. will not use this. Yeah, yeah. this is for our bees. <coughs> So would a minor bee do that? Since it's no. All, since it's hollow? Yeah. No. It would, the minor bee will go into the ground. And what I don't have a picture of is the sand pile that we put behind this mm -hmm. since I took that picture. That we're, we're waiting to see if the bees will come. Mm -hmm. We know that somebody else who built up a dirt pile sort of accidentally and then left it had minor bees move in. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that that will work too. Providing them food, um, plant, plant so that you have something blooming all season long from the beginning. That can, whether if you're okay with dandelions, leave your dandelions because they're good for the bees. Mm -hmm. Some people plant crocuses, but willows and aspen are um, all good bee foods, especially willows. They produce <coughs> a lot of nectar and pollen. And then this is a portion of the rain garden that we installed next to one of our new buildings. And I don't know if you can see, but there's at least a half a dozen bumblebees. There's one right oh, there goodness. on each of these. It turns out they really like this plant. And which is that plant? The plant, that's Culver's root. Culver's. Culver's root. C-U-L-V-E-R. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is um, the person that we were mentioning before, with the Guide to Native Plants for Your Zip Code, Doug Tallamy. So this is the book that he wrote called Bringing Nature Home. And again, his message is incorporate native plants, native to your region, into your landscape, because ultimately that provides the best support for wildlife. And as our landscape becomes more suburban, it's, it becomes increasingly important to, um, to support the wildlife that we have. 
and then plant seasonally and use varied flower structures. Some turns out some bees have long tongues, some bees have short tongues, and they need different kinds of flowers to be successful. So mm -hmm. the more variety, the better for the bees. And then just to recap our pollinators, we have one bird. <laughs> we have 105 different butterflies in the state. And we have at least 350 different kinds of bees. Wow. And all of them are important as pollinators for our wildflowers. The, some of the bees are also important for our food crops. It turns out that bumblebees are much better pollinators for blueberries and cranberries and even tomatoes than our honeybees are. So anytime you eat a tomato, thank a bumblebee. Mm -hmm. Use native trees and flowers. Be a little messy. I have a farmer friend in Vermont who says his new slogan is embrace scruffy. <laughs> it gives you permission to have a little bit of a scruffy garden, which I find very, um, very de-stressing. Use friendly pest management. Respect the bees because they're not out to hurt you. And enjoy them. And our pollinators say thank you very much. <laughs> at 7 o'clock, 7 a.m. Um, at, at Breakfast Hill Farm with Jeff Collins, who's also from the Mass Audubon. Um, the, uh, we hope it's, not it's not going to rain. It's not going to rain. It's not going to rain. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Or snow. Or snow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for um, a couple other things I just wanted to mention to keep an eye out for this uh, summer is um, uh, Art on the Trails is going to happen again at Beals Preserve, uh, a project of South Borough resident Catherine Weber, uh, who's a SALF member, and the South Borough Open Land Foundation. It opens on Wednesday, June 13th, and this juried show features 18 artists who will be installing some very unique and unexpected visual treats along the trails of the Beals Preserve. It will remain open uh, through September 23rd. And then the other thing is, which I have plenty of handouts for, is um, my little, one of my pet projects for the summer, summer evening strolls. And our, our new uh, SALF member here, uh, Tim Fish, uh, joined with, his, with um, us on our, the first walk that we had uh, this past Sunday. Um, it was just a delightful stroll. The first Sunday night of every month, I will be leading a summer evening stroll at Beals Preserve, starting at 6.30 in the evening, meeting at the end of Redgate Lane at the cul-de-sac. And so it's all about just 
taking in whatever there is to see and it's that after the heat of the day the birds become more active um, we can start we know a lot more pollinators and insects and things to look for now that we've seen this so I have these here and for anyone who would like help locating the Open Land Foundation website is uh, I put some uh, brochures right by the door on your way out if you would like one. Thank you. Have I missed anything? Anything, Joy, you can think of? Well, there are plenty more refreshments. Um, please um, feel free to hang around and, and visit and, and consume. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.